Well, good evening and welcome to this service from Money Hall Church in South Birmingham. My name is Phil Sweeting. I'm one of the ministers of the church. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. We'll be doing things um, just a little bit differently tonight in, in some respects. We're starting a new series uh, all about our emotions. And uh, so we won't be, uh, as we usually do, as is our usual practice, taking a, a sort of a portion of the scriptures and seeking to um, look at that in particular and unpack that and see how that applies to our lives. Um, because it's more of a topical thing, we'll be drawing principles from various different scriptures and trying to, uh, particularly today, build a sort of a, a framework um, through which to, to begin understanding and thinking about our emotions biblically. Uh, but you can't get away from emotions. And, uh, and knowing Jesus, being a child of the King, hearing his voice, um, all these things, thinking on our wonderful salvation should affect us emotionally. They should make us glad. Uh, and so we're going to start uh, with the song, I heard the voice of Jesus say, the folk at Emu Music are going to sing it for us. Then after that song, uh, one of our elders, uh, Stephen Brown, is going to lead us in a time of prayer. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. 
Lord God and Father, we do give thanks to you that we can come in the name of Jesus and present our petitions to you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your love, your faithfulness, your kindness. We thank you for your power and wisdom. We know that you created all things. You uphold the planets and the universe and all the forces of nature. And you have not left the world on its own, but you control it and control everything that happens. We know that governments make decisions and a lot of things go wrong, but Lord, you overrule all things for your purposes and for your glory. And we know that your kingdom cannot fail. We confess, Lord, our own sinfulness in spite of all the blessings and your goodness to us, how often we fail to give thanks, how often we fail to rejoice in you. We tend to grumble when we face difficulties and problems. We are unkind to our brothers and sisters and those we love. But we do thank you for your mercy and grace towards us. We thank you for Jesus who died to save us and to redeem us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we ask for your mercy to us. Help us, Lord, to follow you, to remember all that you have done for us and to live in the light of your truth. We know that we are new creatures in Christ. Help us to show this in the way that we live, in our attitudes, in our thoughts, in our speech and in our actions. We think especially of those in the fellowship who are going through times of difficulty and trial at the moment, trials with health, trials with concern for relatives and friends, trials because of bereavement, trials because of concerns regarding employment and finance. You know the difficulties and stresses, Lord, that your people face and we do ask for your help for them and for your comfort. We do think of our nation. We pray for the Queen and ask for your help and comfort for her at this time of sadness and bereavement. We pray for her family too. We think of the government and Parliament and all the decisions that are being made. We pray for justice, truth and fairness. We know there are challenges uh, with people wanting to bring the country further away from your word. But we pray, Lord, for your mercy upon our nation, that there may be a turning back to you, a turning back to your word, Please bless uh, Bible churches and those who are upholding your truth th throughout the, the land. We think also of the uh, wider world and all the terrible problems facing your people in other lands where there is inadequate health care, where people who are homeless and scattered because they love you and we pray for your help and blessing for them at this time, Lord. We pray for your protection. We do think of Myanmar and pray for your blessing upon your people there, that they may be strong in you and that a peaceful solution to all the conflict there may be found. We think of our overseas uh, 
partners, Mike and Joe, Diane, Paul and uh, Stephanie, Steve and, and uh, Catherine in their move to Wales. And we do ask, Lord, for your help for them and your strength and encouragement, whatever they are facing at this time. We do think of, of our of Birmingham uh, city and pray for uh, Fred Grindrod in the council and ask for wisdom for him and help in his his work and for the uh, forthcoming elections we pray lord that people of integrity may be uh, appointed we do uh, think we do think of all those who are in need at this time who we are aware of lord uh, you know their their names and we ask for your help we pray and thank you, Lord, for your word, for the privileges that we face in being able to meet together uh, to hear your word. We do pray for your help for all those who are involved in the arrangements for meeting again. And thank you for them. We pray for your help for them. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing upon our pastors and elders and our deacons in all the decisions that they're making to bring the church forward that we may bring honor and glory to you pray for your blessing upon your word this evening Lord. please speak to our hearts and may we be ready to hear and to apply your word we do give thanks to you lord for all your goodness and grace and we give all the glory and honor to you in the precious name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Well, our aim today, as I said before, is to set up a sort of a framework for understanding our emotions. Uh, you could call it a biblical anthropology, understanding how, how God has made us as human beings and, and where emotions fit into that. But before we get there, I just want to sort of uh, give us a, a few reasons why I think this is an important subject for us to think about. And first of all, I want to say, mind the gap. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner. But, but I, I want to talk about something, someone, I think it, it might have been Paul Tripp, but I can't remember. Someone called the Gospel Gap. It's my experience as I move around churches that, uh, that for the most part we're, we're pretty good at remembering what Jesus has done for us. And we're glad of that, that he's dealt with our sin, uh, that, that he's uh, taken our punishment so that we can be friends with God. And, and we're okay, um, not quite as good as that one, but we're okay at looking forward to uh, what's to come, the fact that we'll be with our Lord Jesus in heaven, in the new, in the new heavens and the new earth, and we're we're glad of that. But between what Jesus has done and what Jesus will do when He returns, there's this gospel gap. What difference does the gospel make now? I'm persuaded that in many of our churches we underestimate or underemphasize this, or or even lose sight of it completely. And there may be various reasons for that. Perhaps we're a little bit suspicious of these more experiential elements of our faith. And, and that itself may be a reaction to some of the excesses of some other Christian movements. But I think that leads to at least two things. Um, and and the, the most significant in some ways for us, I think, is it, it, it leads to a lack of hope about the possibility of change in, in any area in our life. Uh, it leads similarly to a lack of joy in what the Lord is doing right now in our lives. We, we perhaps in the worst case have no expectation of his work in our lives at all. And that in turn may mean that we lack assurance uh, in our status as much loved children of the King because we're unaware of what he's doing right now. 
I think that's a tragedy. And there's a related tragedy because I think this is significant evangelistically. Since I think in, in these days in which we live now, our non-Christian friends are less interested in whether the gospel is true, which was really where I was coming from 20 odd years ago when I was converted. Now they want to know, does it work? They, they want to know what difference knowing Jesus actually makes now. And so again, if we have no theology of this, if we have no explanation for this, then I think we are weakened evangelistically in our culture. And one of the things I've been pondering a lot over the last uh, sort of 12 months or so is, is what we actually mean when we talk about having a relationship with Jesus. The Bible is full of language uh, talking about him being in us and, and us being in him, we being in him. Paul speaks of longing to be with Jesus. He wants to know Christ more and more. The, the Bible, the big sort of one of the big Bible pictures of, of salvation history and what God is doing in history is, is a love story which culminates in us, the church, being united to Christ um, as, as a bride to her bridegroom. It's relational language. The Song of Songs is not afraid or embarrassed to use erotic language to describe God's passionate love for his people. So, if you'll allow me to speak very personally, I want to know more of that closeness of relationship with Christ. And I long for, for the church that I serve to know that too. Now that is a that's a massive uh, subject. It's a lifetime's work, I'm sure. But but I think one particular stumbling block to to our kind of church thinking about these things is a certain suspicion of emotions. We we shy away from some of that kind of language in the Bible, and we feel awkward even thinking about uh, about that kind of thing because it, it sort of. Rises, uh, raises fears in us of emotionalism and, and we get a bit twitchy as we particularly worried about undermining the centrality of scripture as we pursue Christ. So the aim of this series is to try and uh, start the conversation in some ways about the place of emotions in the Christian life. I, I want us to try and reach towards a biblical understanding of what emotions are and the part that they play in our spiritual life. Now, in doing so, we've got to acknowledge right at the beginning that we're all different. So just as some people are more coordinated and so better at sports, some people are better able to do complex abstract thinking, some people are really good at talking to people, some people are really good at music, There's so many different things. We've got different levels of gifts and skills that, well, so it is on the emotional level. Some people are better at um, both experiencing and responding to their emotions. And not only do we all have sort of different levels in, in, in that way, uh, we're all wired differently, uh, it can change over time. So. Uh, for example, I hardly ever cried in my adult life until Katie and I had our first child. And then it was really, I, I almost felt like something snapped inside, um, something broke. And, and, and now I, you know, I weep at movies and you know, all sorts of things I'll blub about. Which is all by way of just saying, you know, we're all different and we, we will experience emotions um, and respond to them differently and that's okay and we've only got four weeks to, to to think about this so we will only really be able to scratch the surface of what is um, a huge topic uh, I will uh, mention and recommend some books on the way if you want to think some more about the subject uh, and my hope is to schedule uh, either a zoom meeting or a physical meeting if, if uh, things allow at that point after this series is over to uh, think some more about some practical applications and practical aspects of this whole subject. But this evening, I simply want to try to define emotions uh, sort of from a biblical point of view. I understand what the Bible says about them a little uh, and about the part that they play in our lives. 
as I said before, it will be a bit different from most services. We're not going to be focusing in on one particular passage. We'll be dotting around uh, various scriptures to try and gather some of the uh, relevant information. But we are going to have a reading, um, which is a passage that I'm going to come back to um, pretty much at the end. Uh, so we're going to stop now and just uh, turn in our Bibles to Psalm 97. Our reading is from Psalm 97. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world, the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame, those who boast in idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is shed upon the righteous, and joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Well, emotions affect everything. If we didn't experience emotions, then it would be a bit like living in black and white. I think about the, the feelings the emotions that we experience when we see someone we love or when we listen to a piece of music that, that moves us or when we climb a mountain and see an astonishing view which is breathtaking or when we taste a, an exquisite meal or when we feel sickened by a scene of violence or injustice when we feel betrayed by someone we love when we feel really excited about a big event that's, that's coming up or when we feel desperate about a situation which we're in the moment. Or when we feel joy at, at being uh, God's adopted children. The, the, the range of emotions and context for experiencing them is, is just enormous. Now I grew up uh, with the original series of Star Trek. And of course, famously, there was the character Mr Spock, who never appeared to experience emotions. He was strictly logical and rational about everything a and it felt weird it felt unnatural didn't it because because life is full of them a and in fact one of the things i think we'll see today is that it's impossible to separate out our sort of thinking and our emotions you know that the things are all mixed up together but the bible has a lot to say about emotions uh, most obviously the psalms cover a wide range of human emotions and, and experiences and they're written to help us feel uh, uh, as well as think. So it's an excellent question uh, when we read any of the Bible not just to ask um, what is God saying, what does God want me to know or what does God want me to do but how does he want me to feel? How should I be feeling about this thing? He's made us to be emotional beings. So if we don't ever address this subject or think about it, then we're missing out. And actually we're, we're failing to mature as Christians. Now typically um, evangelicals have tended towards extremes. Uh, we always do, don't we? And, and these are going to be caricatures, I understand that. But on the one hand, uh, you have the, the Christian who's completely uh, suspicious of emotions as, as unreliable guides and their instinct is to tend towards ignoring them or suppressing them. It, it can but isn't always um, sort of tied into sort of reserved styles of worship and, and fears of overt emotional displays. That's, that's kind of one end of the spectrum. But the other end of the spectrum we've got people that, that, that are, that are kind of overly focused on emotions. They're, they're suspicious of approaches that are too cerebral and, and, and people are thinking too hard about. They, 
they they tend again I caricature but towards more relaxed and uh, overtly joyful expressions of worship and so on and emotions are, are pretty much the most important thing for them it, if it feels right then it then it must be okay now of course these are caricatures I don't think you need too many uh, that the, the, we need award prizes for for guessing you know which end we might be on. Uh, and, and I don't think we, we, we would go, you know, we're on that side, OK? We're more on that side. I don't think we're as far as that. I don't think we would, um, uh, you know, want to suppress emotions completely. I, I think we, you know, we do recognise that, that, that we are feeling beings, that we do have emotions. But, but and uh, one uh, writer puts it very memorably, he says, for us, uh, emotions are like in-laws who have overstayed their welcome. <laughs> So they kind of we we feel like we could do just as well without them. They're they're sort of optional, uh, that our faith would be okay without them. But I want to suggest that's that's not quite right. So we need first of all to address the question: Well, what is an emotion? Now historically, there have been two major views on this. The first uh, views emotions as as purely uh, a physiological phenomenon. That that is something that exists in the body to do with what the body is experiencing and is unrelated to our mind and our thinking. So on that view, uh, an emotion is simply the name that we give to the feeling that we have when we're experiencing a particular physiological change. So for example, if our hearts are racing, we feel something and that feeling we name anxiety. Or when our eyes produce tears, we, we feel something and we name that feeling sadness. So the, 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 the feeling is, is simply a label that we attach, or, or, or the emotion is simply a label that we attach to the physical feelings that we're experiencing, if that makes sense. Now, my completely unscientific view of that is that it's bonkers. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's true, of course, that the things that we feel uh, can have physiological effects. Um, we, again, we know that from experience. We know that from the Bible. The Bible talks about, uh, you know, even our bones aching when we're feeling certain things. And, uh, and, and we, we know that in our experience. So emotions to physical effects, yeah, we see that. But, but to characterise emotions as simply a response to a, a physical change I think to me is, is completely the wrong way around. Now it's a view that may seem quite attractive to some people because in one sense it gets us off the hook in relation to our emotions because we can't be ultimately responsible for them if they're explained simply by biology and chemistry. So, so I understand why some people like that view. However I find the alternative view more compelling and that sees emotions as related to our thinking and reason. So our emotions are based on our beliefs and our judgments, our thoughts. In other words, emotions are not simply a physical impulse with a label on it. They're an indicator, actually, of what we believe and value. They have an object which causes us to respond or react in a particular way. So, so I don't get angry by thinking about anger. I, I get angry when I think about a situation which makes me angry. I might get angry about a situation of injustice and my anger is the is the visible indicator of the fact that I value justice. Or I might get angry uh, in a situation where my children aren't doing what I've told them to do. And, and in that case, my anger is the visible indicator that I value the obedience of my children or whatever else is going on in my heart. Now, now Matthew Elliot, uh, not our Matthew Elliot, another Matthew Elliot, has written a fairly hefty book about emotions. Uh, it's called Faithful Feelings. Actually, I don't really recommend this one unless you're really interested in thinking deeply about the subject. It's quite academic, uh, quite detailed. But he summarises uh, all that in the following way. He says, emotions are not primitive impulses to be controlled or ignored but cognitive judgments or construals that tell us about ourselves and our world. In this understanding, 
destructive motives can be changed, beneficial emotions can be cultivated, and emotions are a crucial part of morality. There's a lot going on in there. We don't need to worry too much about the detail, but one of the important things here is the recognition that we can cultivate and shape our emotions over time, which is something we'll come back to in, uh, in future weeks. Brian Boardman is an American pastor who's written a book which is somewhat easier to read, uh, Feelings and Faith it's called, and, and I've based uh, the framework for this series on, on his book actually. Um, that's, that's very useful. Uh, and he uses the following working definition of emotions. He says, the emotions are an inherent part of what it means to be a person. They express the values and evaluations of a person and influence motives and conduct. He carries on. Uh, the emotions are more than feelings. They tell us about what we value and what we believe producing desires and inclinations that affect our behaviour. You see the link there? They, they tell us about our values because as we think and respond to a situation based on our values, so we feel, experience this emotion. Uh, Catherine Haddo has written a very readable book on emotions. It's called Mirrors of the Heart. Uh, and uh, it's very practical, actually, in, in terms of working through processing some of your own emotions. Um, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd really recommend that as, a, as a, a, an easy read. I've got a, a, a copy, a spare copy I'm glad to give to someone and a copy I'm glad to lend to someone as well. So first person to contact me afterwards can have that. But, but she calls emotions mirrors of the heart. That, that is, every time you experience an emotion, you get a little glimpse, a little reflection of what is going on in your heart, which is basically what Jesus said in Mark 7, 21 that we were thinking about a few weeks ago in the mornings, when he said, it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. I would say our words, our actions, even our emotions, they're all outflows, evidence of what's going on in our hearts. So ultimately, if we want to change our emotions, we need to change our heart. Emotions, to change the imagery, are the fruit that shows you what kind of tree we are, which is another illustration that Jesus used. So we've got some kind of working definition, handle on what an emotion is, but how does that fit into the biblical picture of being human? Well, as always, our starting point is God himself. As we read the Bible, we see a God revealed who shows emotions. I'm not going to give you a whole list of references now, but you'll be familiar with some of these. But we see a God displaying delight, a God who displays grief, a God who displays anger and compassion, to, to name just a few uh, emotions. Now, God experiences emotions, of course, in a very different way from us. But the fact that he experiences them at all tells us that they are significant. And we, the Bible tells us in Genesis uh, 1 and 2, uh, we are made in the image of God, in the likeness of God. So just as he has the capacity to feel and experience emotions, so do we. As Eliot puts it, emotions are a good and legitimate part of man's character because they are clearly part of God's character. Spoiler alert, that's why later in the series we'll be looking at the example of Christ. Christ, of course, is fully God and fully man. So during his earthly ministry, we see him experiencing perfect emotions. That means we can learn from him what, what it looks like to have right emotions. But that's coming in a, in a future week. For now, we see that biblically our emotions are one of the ways in which we image God. Now, if you know your Bible, of course, we know that the image of God in man has been broken from, from the point of Genesis 3 onwards, where sin uh, and the fall um, and the, the curse affected uh, the whole world and, and particularly affected human beings. Our emotions, like every other part of us, are affected by the fall and by sin. And that, of course, means that we sometimes feel right emotions about the wrong things. We sometimes feel wrong emotions. We sometimes feel 
uh, certain emotions uh, sort of more strongly than we should. And sometimes we don't feel strongly enough about things that we should feel strongly about, and so on and so on. So, so just like our thinking is affected by sin, so our feeling is affected by our sin. But of course, there's the image, there's the image broken. That's not the end of the Bible story, is it? Because actually, the biblical picture of humanity goes on. For those trusting in Jesus, the image of God is slowly being restored. Uh, and one day will be fully restored in, in the new heavens and the new earth. But Baldwin puts it like this. When God begins that wonderful work of redemption, it is a work on the whole person. Any view of saving grace that does not encompass the totality of our humanity is deficient. He's saying God's grace affects everything, how we think, how we feel, everything. So we know the Bible uh, speaks typically about these three areas. It speaks about our minds, what we think, uh, and, and speaks about our wills, that, that is the, what we choose to do, really, uh, and and then also talks about our emotions, the way that we we feel about things or we should feel about things. And all these three areas are the subject of transformation when you become a Christian. So Romans 12, 2 speaks of being transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's, that's part of Christian discipleship, being transformed in your mind, in your thinking. Similarly, Colossians 3 encourages us to set our hearts um, and minds on things above. So part of Christian discipleship is the renewal of our minds. But the Bible also speaks of our wills being brought into conformity with God's will. So Jesus says, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother, back in Mark 3, 35. The Apostle Paul tells the Philippians to, to work out their salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfil his good purpose. That's Philippians 2, 12 and 13. That, that speaks of the way that God is working in us to direct and renew our wills so that we uh, get to a point where we're choosing to do the things that God wants us to do. So that's our minds and our wills, but our emotions too are being reconstructed and renewed and, and re realigned. So the Apostle John writes, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eye and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. John's talking about the renewal of our desires, our how we feel about things, what we what we love. If you change what you value, you change your emotions. And that's why, if you think about it, the Bible can do something which, which often puzzles people. It can command us to have certain emotions. So most famously, Paul in Philippians 4 calls us to rejoice. Hang on a minute, you can't tell someone to rejoice, can you? Well, well Paul, in the bigger picture there, is saying that rejoicing should come as a result of reflecting on the things about God, his, his purposes for us, his presence with us, his provision of all that we need. And, and reflecting on these things should lead us to joy, independently of our circumstances. We'll think some more about how that process works in more detail in the next few sessions. But for now, I just want to make the point that we're called to the renewal of our emotions as God's Spirit works in us so that increasingly we express the right emotions about the right things with the right level of intensity. Well, as we um, kind of begin to draw to a close, I suppose, um, I just want to sort of sketch out the relationship between these sort of three things, our minds, our wills and our emotions. And to, to oversimplify, the thoughts of our minds, well, they lead us to evaluate things in a certain way which provoke certain emotions. And so then the thoughts and the emotions then cause our will to act and to do something. So, um, uh, I'm trying 
trying to think of a, an example, but uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, spending time with Katie is a is a good thing. That's a judgment I've made. I you know, I, I reckon I enjoy spending time with her, and thinking about that idea, um, you know, fills me with with happiness and and causes me to go and make the effort to spend time with her. That's a that's a silly example, but you you get the idea that. The judgments of our mind affect how we react and then what we do. But it's more complicated than that. It's not a simple one-way street from thinking to feeling to doing. Uh, the, the, all the stages are, are related. So the Puritan, Thomas Goodwin, uh, put it like this. Thoughts and affections, how you're feeling about things, are the mutual causes of each other. I love this. Thoughts are the bellows that kindle and inflame infection, affections. And when they are inflamed, they cause thoughts to boil. So the, the thought, as it were, stokes the fire of our emotions. But actually our emotions then, once they're aflame, um, they affect our thoughts as well. Goodwin is saying that are thinking about God, and this is, uh, this is, by the way, is a quote from Graham Bynan's very helpful book as well, Emotions. He's written another one too, but this is the only one I've read so far, but Emotions, Living Life in Colour, very helpful. He said, Goodwin is saying that our thinking about God leads to warm hearts. But more than that, if our hearts are warmed towards God, we think more about him. Think of someone who's fallen in love. As they think about their loved one, they feel love for them. And as they feel love for them, they keep thinking about them. So our thoughts act on our emotions, but our emotions also act on our thoughts. But also, and uh, I can't remember who said this, but emotions were given in order to energise behaviour and were intended by God to be a catalyst for action. So as we feel these emotions, then that should lead us to act. Now this is this tight interrelationship between thinking and feeling and acting is important because we can't separate thinking and feeling. I think the world often wants to try and do that. We're going to just make a nice rational judgment about this thing. You can't because your feelings about the thing affect it. I've often said that in the past, you know, the way I go about decision making is to carefully think about all the options and then go with what my gut says. <laughs> but those things are related, aren't they? And uh, it, because those things are related, then that's got some important implications. It means that all our knowledge about God, and, and we're a church that loves knowing things about God, loves knowing the scriptures and understanding theology, but all that decent reform theology is actually no good to us if it doesn't lead us to right feelings about God. As we learn what God's like, it should cause us to, to love him more and, and, and to, to desire him more and to have joy in him and, and all those things. But, but similarly, if we just have lots of nice warm feelings about God, they're no good for us if they don't arise out of actual real truth about who God is. And both those feelings and those uh, thoughts and knowledge about God. No, neither of those are good if, if they don't get worked out in action. Real faith acts, works, doesn't it, says James. And our thinking and our feelings about God should lead to action, to change, to, to service, to, to love. So the will is motivated by our thinking and feeling. And as we all know, it's possible to do a load of stuff for God without actually having the right thoughts or feelings about it. We can be motivated by entirely the wrong things. A and doing stuff without the right heart and mind is just as dangerous as thinking or feeling the wrong things. So it's all tied together, that's what I'm trying to say. If all that has confused you and tied you in knots, I want to just finish by going back to that Bible reading we had earlier, Psalm 97 chosen that uh, because in some ways it illustrates this interrelationship between mind and truth between emotions and reactions and actions on the other side 
I'm grateful to Graham Bynum's really helpful book for pointing this out. So in these first seven verses, we see the truth about God for our mind. It's great stuff that the Lord reigns. It's wonderful news. He reigns with righteousness and justice. Good, good news, good information that the, the world he created trembles before him and, and the world he created proclaims his glory. This is great truth about God to feel, feed our minds. Although notice, by the way, that it's written in poetry, which is designed not just to convey truth through our minds, but, but to stir an emotional response in us. But anyway, it's an awesome picture, isn't it? No, no wonder those idol worshippers are going to be put to shame. They have nothing on this God. But then as the psalm continues, verse 8 and 9, we see a, the emotional response. The, 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 this part of the psalm moves from what God is like to, to God's people. And, uh, and it illustrates their response to this truth about God. Do you see what happens? They hear this truth and they rejoice that villagers are glad that, that God is like this. The, the truth about God leads to an emotional response. But then how does the psalm finish in verses 10 to 12? Well, well, it leads to action, to living differently. This is how God's people should act in the light of the truth which has stirred these emotions. We're called to live differently, uh, to hate evil, to live under God's protection, to rejoice in him. As Biden summarises, truth about God leads to us to feelings towards God and actions in living for him. That's the standard biblical pattern. Truth is proclaimed, truth is heard, it's understood and believed, and then feelings and actions flow out as a result. Or, as various teaching aids have summarised it, it's about head and heart and hands. Of course, you won't be surprised to hear me say we need to let the word of God be in the driving seat so that as God's spirit works in us, we can think rightly about God and about the world that we live in. And so then we can feel and react rightly, which will then lead us to right actions. There can be dangers, can't there? If we place too much emphasis on emotions, especially if those emotions have not been reordered, uh, reshaped by the word of God. But our aim should not be to suppress or ignore emotions, but rather to see them increasingly sanctified as we seek to live for him. And that's going to be our subject next time. Well, I hope um, there's something there to, to sort of start this conversation going to help us think a little bit more about the place of emotions in our lives. Uh, you've probably got lots of questions or um, been completely confused. I, I, hope, I hope not the latter. Uh, but we will continue to look at this in, in the coming weeks and, and unpack a bit more about what this actually looks like practically. As I said before, um, Jesus experienced emotions. He did so perfectly as, as the, the fully God, fully man. So as we uh, finish our time together now, we're going to turn our, our minds, yes, and our hearts, yes, to his sufferings for us on the cross as we look at the man of sorrows. And our own musicians uh, will sing that for us as we finish our service together.
my debt is paid it is paid in full by the precious blood that my jesus spilled now the 